In the United States, arthroscopy of the temporomandibular joints is traditionally performed under general anesthesia in a sterile setting. Using surface measurements and confirming these with palpation of the joints, the position of the superior joint space is identified. Since the superior joint space is only a potential space, additional room to accommodate the instrumentation is created by opening the mouth and insufflating the joint prior to the percutaneous introduction of a troker and cannula. Following removal of the troker, the arthroscope is inserted and the camera oriented to present an anatomically correct image. Once within the joint space, the meniscus and the vascularized retrodiscal tissue can be appreciated. By altering the angulation and depth of the arthroscope, the eminence and anterior synovial recess can also be inspected. Evidence of biomechanical dysfunction of the temporomandibular joint, such as hesitancy of the meniscus, resulting in the familiar clicking sounds heard by patients, inflammatory synovitis, and broad adhesions that restrict the motion of joint components can easily be discerned. Such is the resolution obtained with an arthroscope for this instrument to be accepted as a valuable diagnostic tool. In this section, we will describe the instrumentation used to perform diagnostic arthroscopies of the temporomandibular joint. Much of it is very similar to that employed in performing arthroscopies of other joints, with the chief differences relating to the size of the instruments. We will begin with the description of the arthroscope itself. Each arthroscope is composed of three systems, an optical system, a viewing assembly that transfers images to a monitor for display, and a light source to illuminate the joint space. The optical system includes a focusing ring to obtain the sharpest image possible for a particular examination field. The Dionics camera is screwed onto the arthroscope via a universal C-mount. A watertight fog-free seal is obtained with the help of a rubber O-ring recessed into the arthroscope end of the camera connection. After inserting the arthroscope, the image is oriented by rotating the microprocessor using the attached cable as a reference. The microprocessor transmits a visual signal to a camera control unit, where the quality of the image can be controlled through various adjustable settings. The microprocessor cable is attached to the camera control unit through a multi-pin connector which is protected during sterilization by a threaded cap. Various hand instruments are used for the percutaneous introduction of the arthroscope. 
To gain access to the joint percutaneously, a trochocannula assembly is used. At first, a sharp-ended trochar, seen on the right, enables the operator to puncture the skin, subcutaneous tissues, and lateral capsule of the joint. However, to reduce the likelihood of damage to the internal structures of the joint, the sharp trocar is immediately replaced with a blunt-tipped obturator seen on the left once entrance is gained into the joint space. Both the trocar and obturator are secured to the cannula by a J-lock fitting. The cannulas used to house the arthroscopic instruments as they are maneuvered around the joint are marked along their length in 5 mm increments except for the distal 15 mm. The total length of the Dionics cannula is 45 mm from hub to tip. The average perpendicular distance from the skin surface to the middle of the posterior pouch of the superior joint space has been determined to be 25 mm, and this knowledge should help an operator gauge his position in the joint when visual landmarks are obscured. The cannula has a sidearm with a lure-type fitting. This is used as an attachment for the irrigating tubing on the scope cannula and also allows for the egress of fluid from the joint through the second cannula. During diagnostic arthroscopy, pathological tissue can be removed from the joint using a biopsy forceps and scissors. These miniaturized instruments have been designed to fit within the inner diameters of the cannulas. A blunt tip probe is often useful to gauge the consistency of joint structures and can also be used to dissect through adhesions or retract structures for closer examination. The hand instrument tray is completed by a magnetized instrument nicknamed the golden retriever. Should an instrument tip unfortunately break off inside the joint, the retriever can be used for its removal, providing the dimensions of the broken tip do not exceed the diameter of the cannula. Arthroscopes can differ from each other in several ways. We would like to illustrate some of these differences by comparing two arthroscopes from two different manufacturers. A difference most often cited is the outer diameter of the arthroscope. However, since the arthroscope is always encased within a cannula, a more significant measurement is the outer diameter of the cannula. This is an end-on view of two different arthroscopes and their respective cannulas. The dimensions of the scope on the left have been given as 1.7 millimeters, and the outer diameter of its cannula measures 2.0 millimeters. The arthroscope on the right has an outer diameter of 2.3 millimeters, but the clearance between the scope and cannula is much less than the first scope. This difference is accounted for by a reduction in thickness of the second cannula's casing. Arthroscopes can also possess different angles of view. The arthroscope displayed on the left has a zero degree angle, while the scope on the right has a 15 degree deflection from the horizontal. 30 degree and 90 degree arthroscopes are currently available, and their selection often depends on individual operator preference and the approach adopted to the joint, whether it is lateral, infralateral, or endoral. Arthroscopes can differ in their lengths, and this is measured between the tip and the hub. Since arthroscopes are pivoted about a point near the surface of the skin, the length of the instrument affects the amount of movement produced at the tip with equal movements of the hand. Longer arthroscopes produce less movement at their tips compared to shorter scopes when equal hand movements are applied. Surgeons will often express an individual preference for one over the other, depending on what they are used to. The last significant difference in arthroscopes relates to their optical system. There are four basic designs currently available, and these are the thin lens system, the rod lens system, the coherent system, and the graded refractory index system, or GRIN. Different optical designs will often affect the quality of the image, as well as the diameter of the arthroscope, and the benefits of one over the other should be determined by the individual surgeon's needs. We will now briefly consider the light source. The light generated by the illuminator is conveyed to the arthroscope by a flexible fiber optic cable.
This cable screws onto the arthroscope through a sidearm connector. The light control box contains both controls for auto illumination of the joint as well as manual control of the light intensity. A light guide test port allows the fiber optic cable to be disconnected from the arthroscope while still on and inserted into the port to test the power of the bulb. The lamp output indicator also reflects the state of the bulb and carries a recommendation for the timing of bulb replacement. The rear panels of the camera control unit, the illuminator and the monitor provide the various connectors to attach the individual units to each other and these are appropriately marked. If a video recorder or a character generator is employed, alterations will need to be made. Two omissions often result in an inferior quality image on the monitor, and these are a failure to connect the illuminator to the video camera unit so that the camera can instruct the light source on the amount of illumination required, and a failure to reattach the terminator caps to the connectors on the rear panels, resulting in electrical signals re-entering the circuitry and causing glare on the monitor. If a video recorder is included in series with the circuit, remember that some recorders have to be in the record mode before an image will appear on the monitor. Sterilization procedures for the different instrumentation can often be obtained from the individual manufacturers. All the hand instruments can be autoclaved or sterilized with ethylene oxide gas. The arthroscope camera microprocessor and the camera and light cables can also undergo gas sterilization. Alternatively, the scope, microprocessor and cables can be soaked for 30 minutes in glutaraldehyde, but before this is done, the microprocessor should be attached to the arthroscope and the protection cap for the camera cable connector screwed in place. We hope that this section has made you familiar with the various components of an arthroscopy system. This next section of the tape will describe a technique for gaining access to the superior joint space of the temporomandibular joint. There are several methods of entering the superior compartment, and often the selection of a particular approach depends on the individual preferences of the arthroscopist. The following is a description of the lateral approach devised by Dr. Joe McCain from Miami, Florida. This technique employs surface measurements obtained from cadaveric studies performed by Drs. Homeland and Helsing from Sweden. The various entry points for the percutaneous introduction of arthroscopic instruments are based on a horizontal line drawn from the midpoint of the tragus to the lateral canthus of the ipsilateral eye. The first entry point is determined by measuring 10 millimeters anterior to the middle of the tragus along the tragal canthal line and dropping 2 millimeters inferior to this point. This coordinate corresponds to the posterior synovial pouch between the meniscus and the height of the glenoid fossa. Since this is most commonly the initial site for the introduction of the arthroscope during diagnostic arthroscopy, it can be designated the primary portal. Fifteen millimeters anterior to the middle of the tragus on the reference line and five millimeters below this point corresponds to the posterior slope of the eminence near its height. This site will usually not allow an unimpeded sweep of the joint by an arthroscope and cannula and is reserved for the insertion of a large diameter needle for the egress of irrigating fluid.
The secondary portal is usually placed 27 millimeters anterior to the midpoint of the tragus and 7 millimeters below this measurement. This coordinate will allow an instrument to be inserted percutaneously into the anterior synovial recess near the anterior slope of the eminence. The secondary portal can be used as an outflow for the irrigant, as an access for hand or motorized instruments, or as an alternate site for an arthroscope. It must be continuously emphasized that these measurements merely provide a guide for the location of the various regions in the superior joint space. The actual puncture sites should only be chosen after confirming the accuracy of the measurements by manual palpation of the joint in motion.